Hello, BookTube. Well, it's another bookshelf tour. This is the third shelf of the skinny West Wall bookcase. Uh, and as I warned, it, it's the one of the only shelves in this room. In fact, it might be, aside from the penguins and the little literary criticism, I think it's the only bookshelf in this room that actually has a theme. Uh, not a very big theme, so not a very big shelf, but uh, I wanted to warn you because it's the only kind of book you're going to hear about <laughs> in this video. Uh, and it, the theme is John F. Kennedy. Um, so we'll start with the transverse books, the ones that are piled on top of the others, uh, just to uh, get them out of the way. But uh, it's, let's see, uh, eight books, and they're all about uh, President Kennedy. So if that doesn't interest you, this then this video won't be for you. <laughs> unless, unless, as so many of you commented, you're just interested in looking at the dogs. <laughs> a, couple, a couple of people commented, a couple of people emailed and said all I'd have to do is make videos, silent videos of the dogs on the bed. And I, would, I would triple my subscriber count. <laughs> I don't doubt that's true, uh, but <laughs> oh, there's nowhere else that they can go. If I'm in the room sitting on the floor filming a video, it's not like they can be elsewhere in the apartment. They would they would instantly want to be in here, and they can't be on the floor. It's too hard and too cold for them, so <laughs> they have to be in the video. Not that I mind anyway. I want them here. Don't I? You so you do, baby. Oh, I do, my little hippo. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so we're going to start. We'll start with... Uh, We'll start with an objection of mine, with a slight bit of defensiveness before we get to the books themselves. And they don't involve a dead president, they involve a dead demagogue. They involve Christopher Hitchens, uh, who's known to many of you. He is the god of a certain strata of YouTube. Uh, more popular now than he was when he was alive, which is a weird, a weird thing. Uh, and one of the many things, he was wrong about many things in his life. <laughs> he, was, he was, of course, wrong about socialism. He admitted that. He was wrong about the, the British royal family, especially Prince Charles. He was uh, wrong that women can't be funny. He was wrong that religion poisons everything. These self-confessedly self absurd things that he, would, that he would say and stick by in order to sell bylines. Uh, and one of the things that bothers me the most uh, that he was wrong about was President Kennedy. It's... Uh, it's a touchy subject. I think that uh, that President Kennedy has been ill-served by history, uh, largely because of the legends that grew up around his presidency even when he was alive. The rampant womanizing, the rampant drug-taking, the, the all that sort of thing uh, was firmly in place even before he was shot dead and, and has only gotten worse with time. Now, the, I think I read an essay uh, last year that the, the number of contended mistresses is now so high that Kennedy would have had to do while he was in office literally nothing else but Roger mistresses. He wouldn't have been able to have any of the photo shoots that we see him with. He wouldn't have been able to shake hands with any of the children or the, the civil rights leaders. He wouldn't have been able to sign anything in the Oval Office. He would only, have, just in terms of seconds on the clock, he would only have had time to have mistresses. <laughs> Uh, uh, but I, I have to contend when the subject comes up, it doesn't come up often but when the subject comes up, I have to contend with people like the ghost of Christopher Hitchens who say all sorts of ridiculous things about Kennedy, uh, including one of Hitchens' favorite hobby horses which is that Kennedy was responsible for the Cuban Missile Crisis rather than resolving it but anyway <laughs> uh, so that's the element of defensiveness involved in this shelf, is that I, the reason I have these books, this number, in this concentration, and in this room, is not because I think Kennedy was a bad president. I just wanted to stress that. <laughs> uh, the first one is uh, Arthur Schlesinger, of course, special assistant to the president. This is A Thousand Days. His, his account of the Kennedy presidency, uh, his first-hand account, and it's it's wonderful and it gets my goat not it but the reaction to it gets my goat uh, it's another thing that irritates me about president kennedy is that he assembled around himself some really smart really articulate people uh usually younger people with the with the intentional goal to shake up the thinking of the washington establishment and maybe get some progress made on social issues uh which had largely been allowed to sort of fend for themselves in the, the previous hundred years. And it, it really dusts my doilies when, when knee-jerk cynicism of a later age says that the, describes these young men as court historians. 
meaning that they would work in the Library of Congress and in the records office of the OEOB for five years and comb through their own memories, their own memoirs, the memoirs and memories of their friends and all the diplomatic and civil attaches that were all throughout the White House in those years in order to produce propaganda. The thing that drives me nuts about this is that it assumes as a starting point that these men had no honor and no intellectual probity. And, and the both are, are uh, evident in abundance in A Thousand Days and in most of these books. And, and that, it's just, what is, a, what is a court historian? Someone who's willing to lie for the boss? Is that what we're talking about here? <laughs> if, try putting that to John F. Kennedy and see what his response would have been if you'd said to him, well, I work for you, but I'm also willing to lie for you. <laughs> anyway, anyway, next one is not uh, it's not a court historian. It's uh, one of the very few uh, subsequent histories of the Kennedy administration that isn't, you know, like I mentioned, that isn't barnacled over with with romance and intrigue and mistresses and uh, a whole bunch of faulty assumptions that they just that most historians of the Kennedy administration just simply take on without examining them at all. This is one of the few that doesn't. It's, this is the second edition of the presidency of, of John F. Kennedy. It's by James Giglio. Uh, and it just goes through, uh, you know, what we know and what we don't know. There's a, there was a series of books on the presidencies of certain chief executives, and this is the one on Kennedy, and it actually does a lot of things justice, so I, I was very pleased with it. Uh, and then we go right back to the court historians, and this is the sort of thing that got them that kind of, of epithet. This is... Uh, Johnny, we hardly knew you. Uh, by by uh, Dave Powers and uh, a whole bunch of other. Who, uh, this is uh, Kenny O'Donnell, Joe McCarthy. These are these are were people in the Kennedy administration, um, friends of his, usually Boston friends of his. And this is not meant to be a history. It's meant to be just a, a collection of anecdotes, a collection of warm personal reminiscences, and it does really well at that. Uh, and. Uh, I think I, the reason it's in this room, aside from the fact that I, I think a lot of the anecdotes capture the man really well, uh, and also a lot, as will always be the way, a lot of the anecdotes actually accidentally capture the history really well. Uh, if you sift, if you sift around, if you if you take, you know, go into them with a grain of salt. Uh, but another reason that I that I love it is because you won't always, when it comes to the biographies of the great and famous, you won't always find a companion, a companion volume of warm personal anecdotes. To put it mildly, <laughs> to put it mildly, you have to be the right kind of person to generate this kind of book. It doesn't come from sycophancy. Huh. Then, then we'll move on. <laughs> we'll move on to the to the the short shelf of of uh, normal books. The first one is something we've seen on this channel before. Came right into this room when I found it again. This is Case Closed by Gerald Posner. His his uh, really well written examination of the Kennedy assassination and the Warren Commission and the the House. Committee on Assassinations and all the conspiracy theories that have cropped up since. It's a, it's a tremendous book to read if that subject interests you. Uh, and then uh, we have another Schlesinger book. <laughs> this is, this is uh, Robert Kennedy and His Times, an enormous thing, uh, about uh, John F. Kennedy's brother, who was his, also his, his, uh, his chief hatchet man <laughs> and his uh, district attorney. And this is, uh, it's about Robert Kennedy, and Schlesinger and Robert Kennedy had a, a problematic relationship, which gives the book a really, a kind of a narrative sizzle that I really like. Uh, but it's, as is probably inevitable, uh, John F. Kennedy steals the show on almost every page. So, yeah. <laughs> well, the baby's in focus. I know you're going to be paying more attention to them than you are to me. So <laughs> let's, let's make sure that we get them where you can see them. There they are. There are my little girls. Very rough night, so we're we're all very tired. <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, next we have a uh, laminated bookmark. That's good. And then we have a book by uh, Kennedy's press secretary, uh, Pierre Salinger. This is with Kennedy. Uh, that is the closest that the, any of these books come to towing any kind of party line. Although even by the time he wrote this, and certainly as the years went on, Salinger grew more and more combative and more and more independent-minded. As, as he started to realize the thing that was happening to the Kennedy memory and legacy, he started to realize what was happening, and it was his job to safeguard that legacy while the man was alive. So, of course, he was interested in it. He started to see this slow but inexorable juggernaut of, of 
historical appropriation happening that suddenly the 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 common folk memory was appropriating this man he knew and making him into something that he wasn't in many different ways a warmonger a drug addict a sex addict uh and it started to make salinger more and more combative which made him more and more interesting this book was written at the very beginning of that process i really wish that he had written a, a much later book uh on on Kennedy and maybe on Kennedy in popular memory. Uh, he, he often thought to do that. But I, uh, as far as I know, the manuscript never got written. Uh, and then uh, we have, uh, uh, in my opinion, the best book on Kennedy so far, certainly the best first generation. I don't call them core historians. They're first generation historians. They're still real. They're still historians. They still care about the truth more than they do about propaganda. Uh, and it's insulting to say otherwise unless you can prove it in their written work. It's insulting just to assume it, that if they have a loyalty to the man, they must be willing to lie for the man. That drives me nuts. <laughs> Same thing as, as uh, the, the oft-repeated slur, Hitchens repeated it endlessly, that, uh, that Kennedy himself didn't write the book for which he won the Pulitzer Prize, that, that, it, that, it, that you know, Salinger or, or Ted Sorensen or somebody wrote it for him, uh, when that isn't true, and it's documented to be not true. We have we have eyewitness testimony of, of people who saw him in the act of writing it. We have eyewitness people who jotted their, their signatures at the bottom of every yellow legal pad page saying the contents were substantially the same as the contents they then later saw. There's no room for a ghostwriter. <laughs> and, and not to mention the fact that the young author himself was incredibly tedious while he was writing it, constantly talking about writing it. <sighs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we don't have long to go, don't worry. Uh, uh, the next book, as I said, it's the best of the first generation books on Kennedy. It's just called Kennedy, and it's by Ted Sorensen. And it's another chunker. And it, it's it just uh, it's mostly the same thing as with Kennedy or A Thousand Days. It's a study of the Kennedy White House more than it is the man. Um, but it's really, really good. Really, really good. Yeah, Rereadably good. Uh, and then the last book for this shelf is also rereadably good, unfortunately, in a very bad way. <laughs> I, I've read it, reread it many, many times, but always with a, a, a crack in my heart. It's, it's uh, I must know, if you're familiar with the subject at all, you must see it coming. It's The, the Death of the President um, by William Manchester. This, was, this is his study of the events leading up to the Kennedy assassination, the, the atmosphere around it, the immediate reaction uh, to it, the shockwaves through government uh the shockwaves through the kennedy white house and the, you know those it's the book has been overshadowed by the famous story of its generation and of the the fights that it engendered with the with the kennedy family with jackie kennedy in particular uh, and that's a shame those those fights are a shame they overshadow uh what is a really penetratingly smart book uh but anyway there you have it that is my uh, that is the third bookshelf of the thin West Wall bookcase, and it's the only one in, that we'll deal with that has a, a, a specific theme. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about this happening again. <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'll see you soon, book two. Thank you.